Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be turning to Exodus chapter 21. And just to preface just a little bit, while we're going to read the whole chapter, I'm going to focus on a very narrowed section uh, this morning. So there's a little bit of hope at the end of the tunnel there. It's a very narrow section, even though we're going to read the whole chapter. And one reason why we're going to have Brother Jared Rennie read the whole chapter is because, first of all, I want you all to hear this word. Like, it, it is Scripture. It is God's Word, even though it's part of the flyover part of Scripture that we like to skip over. I think it's appropriate that even though we may not focus on this whole passage this morning, that at least this word is read aloud amongst this body. So please let you know, we're not preaching the whole chapter this morning or probably even next week, but I do want all the word to be spoken. So Brother Jared Rennie in his very um, bass, baritone voice is going to share behind me. Thank you. Appreciate Brother Jared's willingness to read this this morning. Thank you, sir. He twists my arm every time to get me up here, but... Boy, God is good. Man, his spirit's moving in this place. I love it. Okay, he didn't call me up here to do that. <clears throat> Chapter 21. And I'm reading out of the HCSB, so it might be just slightly different there. These are the ordinances that you must set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he is to serve for six years. Then in the seventh, he is to leave as a free man without paying anything. If he arrives alone, he is to leave alone. If he arrives with a wife, his wife is to leave with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children belong to her master and the man must leave alone. But if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I do not want to leave as a free man. His master is to bring him to the judges and then bring him to the door or doorpost. His master must pierce his ear with an awl, and he will serve his master for life. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she is not to leave as the male slaves do. If she is displeasing to her master, who chose her for himself, then he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has acted treacherously toward her. Or if he chooses her for his son, he must deal with her according to the customary treatment of daughters. If he takes an additional wife, he must not reduce the food, clothing, or marital rights of the first wife. And if he does not do these three things for her, she may leave free of charge without any exchange of money. Whoever strikes a person so that he dies, must be put to death. But if he didn't intend any harm, and yet God caused it to happen by his hand, I will appoint a place for you where he may flee. If a person schemes and willfully acts against his neighbor to murder him, you must take him from my altar to be put to death. Whoever strikes his father or his mother must be put to death. Whoever kidnaps a person must be put to death, whether he sells him or the person is found in his possession. Whoever curses his father or his mother must be put to death. When men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or his fist, and the injured man does not die but is confined to bed, if he can later get up and walk around outside leaning on his staff, then the one who struck him will be exempt from punishment. Nevertheless, he must pay for his lost work time and provide for his complete recovery. When a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies under his abuse, the owner must be punished. However, if the slave can stand up after a day or two, the owner should not be punished because he is his owner's property. When men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her children are born prematurely, but there is no injury, the one who hit her must be fined as the woman's husband demands from him and he must pay according to judicial assessment. If there is an injury, then you must give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. When a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he must let the slave go free in compensation for his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his male or female slave, he must let the slave go free in compensation for his tooth. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox must be stoned, and its meat may not be eaten, but the ox's owner is innocent. 
However, if the ox was in the habit of goring, and its owner has been warned yet does not restrain it, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox must be stoned, and its owner must also be put to death. If instead a ransom is demanded of him, he can pay a redemption price for his life in the full amount demanded from him. If it gores a son or a daughter, he is to be dealt with according to this same law. If the ox gores a male or female slave, he must give 30 shekels of silver to the slave's master, and the ox must be stoned. When a man uncovers a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit must give compensation. He must pay money to its owner, but the dead animal will become his. When a man's ox injures his neighbor's ox and it dies, they must sell the live ox and divide its proceeds. They must also divide the dead animal. If, however, it is known that the ox was in the habit of goring, yet its owner has not restrained it, he must compensate fully ox for ox. The dead animal will become his. Thank you, sir. Now, when you're reading across a passage of scripture like this, many of us are like, what? What do we do with this? What do we do with this? And, you know, it would be irresponsible for me as a pastor to be like, I don't know what to do with this. Oh, you know, it's not the good stuff. Actually, I find that this passage of Scripture is very deep, very wonderful. Well, I'm not going to preach every aspect of that because that would just take weeks and weeks and weeks. The big picture of this is this, is that we see that God is adding a level of responsibility to the law. And he is elevating the responsibility of Israel to their neighbors and to their people. That's kind of how you would summarize a lot of that. But we find here that this section, the next few chapters, are what we call the Book of the Covenant. Ten Commandments have just been given. Now from here until about Exodus 24 or so, we find what we call the Book of the Covenant. Interestingly, the, the first Ten Commandments, we know according to Exodus 24, the first Ten Commandments were written by the hand of God upon the stone. Now this particular section, God tells Moses, and Moses writes it down. But why is this even in the Bible? Why is this even here? Well, what we find here is this, is that this section focuses on the application of the Ten Commandments. In other words, it answers this question. These next few sections of Exodus answers the question, what would it look like to practice God's holy law amid unholy situations. That's what it's doing. You have the Ten Commandments. Do not kill, you know, do not murder, do not steal, do not do these things, right? Ten Commandments, very short, very sweet to the point. And now the next few chapters demonstrate what it looks like to apply God's holy law amid unholy situations. And so these next few following chapters are much like what we call case law, in today's day and age. Consider how we teach law today. Lawyers are taught by both reading the letter of the law, and then they are taught through case studies that illustrate how these laws are applied. This section acts like a case study. And these examples help express God's holiness in ordinary life. Now, I completely understand that most of us, if not all of us, struggle with passages like Exodus 21. Exodus 20 is great. Exodus 18 and 19 are fun. We're fixing to get into fun, some more fun stuff in Exodus later on. But we eventually reach places like Exodus 21 if we're reading our Bible through our year or whatever the case might be, and a few things happen. We begin to skip or be, we begin to get very sleepy, right? Right? Like, nobody's going out there and making t-shirts with Exodus 21 stuff written on it. I know it's a big thing for people to have, like, tattoos with scripture verses and life verses. No one's putting Exodus 21 as a life verse on there, you know? And yet, because we have a high view of scripture, we must recognize that because it's in our Bible, there must be some type of application our value to us today. In fact, someone far smarter than I wrote this. He said, the mere fact that it is in the Bible means that it merits our attention. But the book of the covenant also teaches us how to live 
for God day by day. First, God gave Israel his moral law in the form of the Ten Commandments. And then he showed them how to apply his law in various life situations. And this is where the book of the covenant comes in. It is an application of the Decalogue, or the Ten Words, to the specific social context of Israel as a nation. So today, although we look at a very larger than usual passage, we're going to narrow our focus down for just a few moments. And here's what I think you, want, you need to see and notice first off, is notice that as this book of the covenant is being written, God is giving his instructions, there's something called like the law of first mention. Usually what you mention or say first is what you really mean, right? So have you ever done one of those things where you just come up to someone and I'm like, all right, don't think about it. Tell me immediately what comes to your mind. Do you want to go to Mexican or Chinese food? Don't think about it. Just tell me because I'm good either way, right? Well, what usually comes out first is really what you mean. It's what's most important. And notice the God of the universe, the one who orchestrates it all, the one who does everything in perfect order, notice what he talks about first. He could have been talking about the ways we shouldn't kill people. He could have been talking about ways that we shouldn't have other gods. But no, instead, he starts the book of the covenant by addressing the issue of slavery. Now, we have to remember, like, 50 days before, 60 days before, Israel was a group of what? Slaves. Like, they have not been free for very long. I know it's taken me a long time to preach through this, but they've not been free for very long. <laughs> so about 50 or 60 days before, these million, million and a half people had been slaves. Slaves in Egypt, slave to Pharaoh, slave to their masters. And so they knew all about what it meant to be slavery. And yet God knows this about us, that it doesn't take us very long to forget where we came from. We quickly forget where we had been not too long before. We quickly, for, quickly forget what God has redeemed us from, and Israel was certainly no exception. And God knows the human tendencies to both forget and to oppress. For 10 generations, slavery was their lineage. And you know what slaves? Slaves do what slaves know best. They perpetuate slavery. And ever since sin entered humanity, humanity has engaged in some form of slavery. And I hate to say it, but slavery still happens very much today. And I want you to know this. Sin knows nothing of freedom, but only slavery. Sin knows nothing about what true freedom is. It only knows slavery. Therefore, it comes naturally for sinful people to subject other people to some form of slavery. And the only thing that can break the power and prevalence of slavery is the blood of Jesus. The only thing that breaks the power and the prevalence of slavery is the blood of Jesus. Now, because I'm a history person, I think it's important for us to understand context and backgrounds. And we need to understand that slavery happened for numerous different reasons in the ancient world. And one of the main reasons in Jewish society that slavery happened was the failure to be able to pay debts or to failure to be able to take care of themselves and provide for their personal needs. And so when a person could not pay back a debt, they could sell themselves or their children, usually their daughter, to the person that they borrowed money from. Or sometimes a poor person would sell themselves in order to meet their needs, much like what we would call an indentured servant. Now, so when you read about slavery in Scripture, please don't immediately picture the American form of slavery and gone with the wind and this American Civil War. That's not what we're talking about. That's in a very extreme, nasty form of slavery. And dare I say that unfortunately, for many, many years, Christians use Scripture to perpetuate slavery. But allow me just to unequivocally state this. Scripture is against slavery, period. 
And if the microphones weren't so expensive, I would drop the mic right there. <laughs> Many people perpetuated slavery because they did not understand what God said and what God meant. Just want to throw that out there. Because what we notice in places like Exodus chapter 21 is that God designed Israel to be very different even when it involves a thing like slavery. And he begins by saying that a Hebrew could only sell themselves, could only give themselves into slavery for six years. Not forever. They were not selling themselves forever in this debt. Six years, they could sell themselves into slavery. But on the seventh year, they were to be set free. The seventh year was to be a year of release or a year of, dare I say, Sabbath, right? God places this rhythm all throughout his created order. His people were to rest on every seventh day. His people were to release debts and their slaves in the seventh year. And every 50th year was a year of what they called the year of Jubilee, which canceled all debts and returned family property back to the family. Why is that? Because never again did God want his people to be known as slaves. And then he's laying out this more fundamental reason. Why could a person sell themselves into slavery for six years, but in the seventh they had to be released? Because catch this. A person's financial position or personal freedom did not diminish their access to the covenant. Even when a child of Israel found themselves in a difficult time, you know what they still were? They They were still still one of God's children. children. Even when they were having to sell the family farm and they felt that their lives were a failure, you know who they still were? They were still a child of God. Even though things were not going the way they wanted, perhaps there was great famine in the land, perhaps they still had a great reason to do this, God wanted them to know that your identity was no longer a slave, but you will forever be known as an heir of the promise of God. So whether you sold yourself into slavery or not, you were still under the protection of God. Therefore, They could not be forced to serve forever, but only for a season. And then I want you to notice this as we read in Exodus 21, that the treatment of the master to the slave was to be a very high character. Verses 5 and 6. But if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I do not want to leave as a free man. His master is to bring him to the judges and then bring him to the door or doorpost. And his master will pierce his ear and he will serve his master for life. When we read a passage like this, we must be confronted with this kind of question. How good would a master have to treat his slave that the slave would be willing to stay? How loving would this master have to be that someone would willingly lay down their rights in order to stay with that person? The Apostle Paul hints at this in his teachings to masters of slaves in Ephesians and Colossians. Paul didn't demand that they release their slaves, but he did demand that the masters be so Christ-like that the slave would willingly love and serve their master. So how good would the master have to be for someone to say, you know what, even though I'm your slave, I love you so much, I don't want to leave. What kind of love is that? And then we enter into this very interesting detail. This is what we're going to focus this morning. We see a reference to a pierced ear. Now, as much as you want to think that it's a new thing or it's a common culture thing, almost every culture since almost the beginning, has pierced their ears or some part of their body. But interestingly, this detail is mentioned here in Exodus 21, 
And when you're reading your Bible at home, when you're doing your Bible studies, you need to be asking yourself, that's kind of a weird detail. What does this mean? And what does this point to? And we need to understand that the attachment to the doorpost indicated that the slave had become a member of the household. According to the many scholars that I consulted, it seems that this may not be the doorpost of the home, but possibly the doorpost to the tabernacle. And if you want to check my references, my notes are online. You can follow along. They're all footnoted. So catch this and picture this for a moment. A a slave would say, you know what? I don't want to go free. I love where I'm at. I love my master. I love the wife that I've gathered. I've loved my children. I am willing to lay down my freedom and serve this guy for the rest of my life. Then the master and the slave would go to the public place, perhaps to the doorframe or to a door at the tabernacle. And this declaration of love would be uh, evidenced by the presence of witnesses. Now, the English says that this should be done in front of the judges, but as we dig a little bit deeper into the Hebrew, there's some variations that come to play. And it looks like it says that not in the presence of judges, but it says in the presence of God. So bring him to God. And and so if he's bringing him to God, where would the Israelites take them to go into the presence of God? They would take him to the tabernacle or temple or whatever might be the case at that time. And so we need to understand that the pierced ear was a renunciation of freedom and a holy oath to love and follow the master the rest of his days. Now, take a deep breath because it gets really good here. Okay, I promise you. If if this is a three-course meal, what I've just laid out has been the salad, you know, kind of pointless, kind of filler, but it has a purpose, right? (laughs) It has a purpose. Because this leads us to some incredible symbolism. One author wrote, The ear is the most important part of a servant's body. He has to hear before he can obey. And so by having his ear pierced, therefore, the servant was making a public commitment to do what his master said. The doorpost was also symbolic. Not only did it serve as a place for driving the owl, but it also showed that the servant was now attached to, to the master's household. And the doorpost was marked with the blood of a covenant between master and slave, end quote. So picture this. Use your imagination for just a moment. Quite possibly at the tabernacle, there was a doorpost or a door. And that door or doorpost might have had many other reasons Obviously, it was put there to allow people to go from one place to another. But at certain times, at certain places, and for certain people, this doorpost had a special significance. And as you would walk up to this door frame or to this door, the casual observer might notice that there was, all along the top of it, there was these random little holes that had been punched. And perhaps... Maybe a little bit of dry blood still left. And imagine seeing this for the first time. And maybe a child asking, Daddy, what do all these holes mean? For the child would know that every part of the tabernacle would have some type of purpose. And at that moment, the father might have the opportunity to say, Let me tell you, son, that all of those marks are signs of someone who had been a slave But because they had a loving master, was willing to lay down their freedom to serve the rest of their lives in their master's household. And so when the people would walk by, they would see all these piercings and all these holes. And they would know that these were expressions of someone who laid their life down for their master. And each mark would be expressions of love, commitment, of gratitude, and thankfulness. And perhaps if if we are wrong in being at the tabernacle, even if it was at the master's door, someone who had been wealthy, wealthy enough to be able to pay the debts of someone, 
You can imagine as the hustle and bustle of servants had, would go in day after day after day that it, perhaps a new servant would come and they would come up to this particular door and the servant would look and they would see the marks where someone who had been a slave just like themselves had declared that furthermore they loved their master and they were willing to stay. And perhaps that person who was thinking, oh, I'm only going to serve six years and then I'm, out, then I'm out, would begin to think or wonder, I wonder how loving this new master must be. I wonder how good he must be if all these slaves who had gone before me decided to stay. You see, each mark on that doorframe for some, it looked like slavery, but to others, it felt like freedom. What looked like slavery to some felt like freedom to others. And so as this person had their ear pierced, it wasn't just a hole, but in order for the hole not to grow up, they would put some type of ring into it, I'm sure. And so when the person walked into town with his ear pierced, this is not for women, this was only for men. With his ear pierced and the master's ring put in there, they happily announced that being a slave to a loving master is better than freedom to sin. But not only does the symbolism continue, where there is a piercing, there is at least a little bit of blood. And the blood of the pierced ear hearkened back to another experience that had happened not too terribly long before. How just in a couple of months before, the blood of lambs was splattered on the what? On the doorpost. See, this is what happens when you skip over chapters like Exodus 21. You see, the blood of the lamb that was marked over the doorpost Marked Israel's freedom from what? Slavery. It pronounced their freedom from slavery to Egypt. And as someone once said, blood on the doorframe is one of the most iconic images of this transfer from slavery into following a new master in freedom. And the blood of the Messiah from his pierced flesh on the cross the blood of the Passover lamb on the lentils, and the blood of the slave who for love agrees to serve his master willingly. Pastor, you're kind of stretching this a little bit. What about the significance that King David proclaims in Psalm chapter 40, verses 6 through 8? David, writing prophetically, says in Psalm 46 through 8, you do not delight in the sacrifice and offering. And this next phrase, you open my ears to listen. In Hebrew, guess what it says? It says, you pierced my ears to listen. And if you want to see the Hebrew root words and stuff like that, it's at the end of my notes. You can do your own homework. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering or a sin offering. Then I said, see, I have come in the scroll. It is written about me. I delight to do your will, my God, and your instruction is deep within me. In Psalm chapter 40, written a few thousand years after Exodus 21, David proclaims that God desires more from us than just offering the right sacrifice at the right time. In our parlance, in our language, God desires more from you than just going to church and doing the right religious thing. <clears throat> but instead, God desires our whole life given to Him as He is the loving Master and we are the thankful slaves. And then this psalm, Psalm 40, takes on greater significance when it's understood as a prophecy of Jesus. David, once again, acting prophetically, foretells of what Jesus would do. For it is Jesus who is saying, See, I have come in the scroll it is written about me, that I delight to do your will, my God, and your instruction is deep within me. 
We must understand that Jesus offered himself to the will of the Father, accepting, get this, the piercing that marked him as belonging to the Father. Piercing? That marked Jesus as belonging to the Father? Show me scripture. I think I will. Philippians chapter 2. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. Beginning with verse 5. The Apostle Paul writes, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Who? Who? existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. The Greek word, duolos, is often translated servant or slave. He assumed the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says that Jesus assumed the form of a servant or of a slave and that he laid down his will and he laid down his rights and he laid down his life to the will of his loving father. But whereas a slave would have his ear pierced, Jesus didn't have his ear pierced. Instead, his heart was pierced instead. You catch it? His hands were pierced. His feet were pierced. But the last act of a Roman soldier, who he himself, unless he was of certain rank or a centurion, he himself, the statistics are highly likely that he was either a slave or had been a slave. Catch it. Check my history. But you'll find that the majority of people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Very small percentage were free people. So this Roman soldier had either been a slave or he was a slave. In that moment, when he refuses to break the legs of Jesus, because that's what they did to everybody else. Instead, when he draws his spear and he points it up and he pierces the side of the Savior. And that thing goes into his heart and blood be or water begins to pour out. The ultimate piercing took place. In Exodus 21, a slave who's saying, I love my master, I will follow you for the rest of my days. In that point, he has his ear pierced. Now Jesus takes it one step further, and he says, I will not have my ear pierced, I'll have my heart pierced instead. Jesus was willing to do this. Because he knew that his father would not leave him in death, but would raise him back to life. You see, when you and I give our lives to Jesus, we are not entrusting our lives into the hands of a despot or a tyrant or even a revengeful God. When I gave my life to Jesus, I declared that serving Jesus was better than serving the devil, is better than serving myself, and better than serving my flesh. So brothers and sisters, ours is not a gospel of freedom to self, but to a freedom to serve God with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our souls. And therefore, it becomes appropriate for you and I to stand or to kneel at the foot of the cross and ask the question, what sort of love is this that has saved us? What kind of God is it that has offered this incredible redemption? What kind of love is it that died for me? What kind of love is it that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me? Do you remember how sinful you were? Remember how lost you had been? 
how broken you were? What kind of love have we come to? I recently read a story that, although it's probably fiction, it reflects the kind of love we're talking about. The story is told of a visit of Abraham Lincoln, who once went and visited a slave auction, where he was appalled to see the buying and selling of human beings. And it says that his heart was especially drawn to a young woman on the block whose stories seemed to be told in her eyes. She looked with hatred and contempt on everyone around her. She had been used and abused all of her life, and this time was just one more cruel humiliation. The bidding began, and Lincoln offered a bid. And as the other amounts were bid, he counterbid with larger amounts until he won. And when he paid the auctioneer the money and took title to the young woman, she stared at him with a vicious contempt. And she asked him what he was going to do with her next. And it's said that Abraham Lincoln said, I'm going to set you free. Free, she asked. Free for what? Just free, Lincoln answered. Completely free. Free to do whatever I want to do? Yes, he said, free to do whatever you want to do. I mean, free to say whatever I want to say? Yes, free to say whatever you want to say. And does that mean I'm free to go wherever I want to go? She added with skepticism, and Lincoln answered, you are free to go anywhere you want to go. And our response was, she said, that I'm going with you. You see, I know what I was like when I gave my life to Jesus. And while the Lord kept me from a lot of sin and a lot of big mistakes, I know where I was going. I know even to this day the propensity of my heart. And I I can only imagine where I would be if it wasn't for Jesus. And I also remembered That early on I gave my life to Jesus, not out of a great love, but out of a great fear. Perhaps when you gave your life to Jesus, you feared going to hell. Perhaps you feared where life was taking you. Perhaps you feared what was waiting for you on the other side of death. And just as people sold themselves into slavery in ancient times to escape bad and desperate situations... Maybe you gave your life to Jesus out of desperation and despair. But now that you have been with Jesus for a little while, you realize that even though you came in desperation, you have stayed for the love. Today, the ancient passage of Exodus chapter 21 invites us to give our lives to Jesus once again. Perhaps you don't love Jesus as deeply as you want to. Perhaps you've never given your life to Jesus, and yet you find yourself today at church for this message at this time. Maybe you find yourself where you're giving him six years, but not the lifetime. Maybe if you were honest, you'd find yourself that you looking out for something better, where you could be the boss. To approach Jesus. As the one who loved us deeply. Do you remember how much Jesus loves you? We teach our children how to sing the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. But something happens as an adult and we forget. We get caught up raising families and kids and working. And we eventually reach a place where we don't sing songs like, Jesus loves me, this I know. In fact, many of us may be at a place of crisis. A place of a crisis of conscience. You're at church because you know that's where you're supposed to be, but you're not really sure if Jesus loves you quite like this. Maybe you are too often reminded of how lost, how broken, how hurting you are, and you wonder, can Jesus possibly love me like this?
And yet the word of God for us today is this. He loves you more than you possibly can imagine. And today, like most Sundays, it's an opportunity for us to tell our fellow brothers and sisters and to tell Jesus that, Jesus, you know what? I'm going to hold nothing back from you. I'm going to keep nothing for myself. See, church, we are called to give Jesus more than our ears We're called to give him our lives. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17, as Jenny comes to the piano for just a moment. The Apostle Paul wrote towards the end of his ministry, he says this, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, because I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The word marks is actually a Greek word. It's stigma. Have you ever heard of the word stigma? If there's a stigma attached, that's the Greek word here. And it's a word to describe a piercing, a scar, or a brand that signifies ownership. The Apostle Paul was proud that his life and his body displayed who it was that he served. And brothers and sisters, it is time for you and I to live and to bear the marks of of a fully devoted life to Jesus. So here's how I ask us to spend the next few moments. Would you stand this morning across this place? And I want to ask you to do this. Once again, we're talking about a stigma. We're talking about a mark, a piercing. We're not going to pierce anything today. But I am going to ask you this. Would you come to the front for just a moment as a public expression of your love and devotion to Jesus? And as you come to the front, would you just take a moment in your own words, would you just say, Jesus...